Hi everyone, um, welcome to uh, this month's Friday Exchange from the Police Foundation. Um, I'm Rick Muir, I'm Director of the Foundation, uh, and we're delighted today to have with us Sal Nassim, who's former London Regional Director of the Independent Office of Police Conduct, um, and will be known to many of you, um, has been involved in lots of very high profile cases over the years at the IOPC um, and uh, we're looking forward to having a, a good discussion about uh, lots of the big themes and issues around police accountability, governance, complaints and, and so on. Um, just a, a few housekeeping things just before we start, we are recording this um uh so just bear that in mind when you're making comments this this goes up on our youtube channel so it will be um out there in the public space space um uh, also if you have any um questions for sal um please just put them in the chat uh, and i will um sort of read read them out as we as we go along so uh, feel free to uh, to put your questions uh, and, and comments in there um um, I should say up front that we are, um, uh, Sal and I are going to have a conversation around general themes emerging from his work, and we're not going to dive into specific cases. Um, I think it's important to say that just so everyone's aware, um, because that, that wouldn't be appropriate. So, um, but um, I hope you uh, enjoy this conversation. So, Sal, uh, thanks very much for, for joining us. Um, and I wondered if you could start off by just telling us a bit about your background and kind of the the story uh, which sort of got you to end up working in um, the police complaint system and, and what that trajectory looked like. Uh, happy to and thanks very much for the invitation. It's a real privilege to take part in the conversation, Rick. Uh, so you can tell from the accent, I'm Scottish, you know, originally a uh, long time ago, got a law degree from University of Glasgow never practised, um, spent the early part of my career in Scotland. Then I came to England and started a career really in public service, um, spent a number of years in different regulatory bodies, including uh, the Audit Commission, uh, Legal Ombudsman, Ofqual. And then over a decade ago, I seen uh, a job come up at the Independent Police Complaints Commission and it looked fascinating and my skill set fitted. And I took a pay cut and I took a punt and I joined. And um, then two promotions after that um, and five years after, I, in 2019, I became regional director for London at the IOPC. So that was my routine, maybe a bit unconventional, but I was really drawn to the purpose of the work and it just looked fascinating and um, I was proven right. Yeah, and what well, what was, uh, just just tell us a bit more about that. What what was it that you, the um, that drew you to it, to the idea of working on um, uh, on policing and on uh, police accountability? I think what drew me to it, I mean, I'd heard about the Independent Police Complaints Commission back at that time. I knew where it had come from. I knew its genesis. It had come from um, the Stephen Lawrence inquiry and Sir William McPherson's report that, you know, an independent body was required um, for the reasons set out and the, the report for public confidence um, and for all the, the failings identified in the inquiry and the report. And here was an opportunity for me to kind of um, take the experience I had and look at it in an organisation that was trying to look at police accountability, but also had a really difficult mandate of trying to improve public confidence in policing, which is a really broad, difficult mandate. but it spoke to both kind of personal purpose and the organisation had a really strong vision. And it, it drew me in, it drew me in. I had this diverse skill set and I thought, this is an organisation um, that I really want to work for. And that's what drew me in, Rick. Yeah, great. Um, and um, well, let, let's let's talk a bit about the police um, complaint system. And um, I just wonder, and, and the police misconduct system, um, I just wonder what your reflections are on how that system operates um, and, you know, where where you think it's, uh, yeah, what do you think its its strengths are, its, its weaknesses are? 
mean, that's that's such a big question, isn't it? Such a big question. I mean, I spent the best part of a decade working in it and had a number of roles, you know, operated in the system at one of the most contentious recent times in policing, arguably as well. Um, so I have a huge, hugely concentrated set of experiences um, and stories, to be honest, from it. Um, and always, you know, from a position and perspectives of complainants, from victims, from police officers. And um, now that, you know, I left last year and, and reflecting back in my experience, I come to the unescapable view, Rick, that the system needs reform. Yeah. The system needs reform. You know, I operated in the system and and let's just focus on the IOPC for a second. So the IOPC becomes a lightning rod for criticism for everything that goes on in the system. And I'm not here to be the IOPC spokesperson. I'm here as somebody who, who worked in the system. But the, when you're in the system, you only truly understand that the system is such and the legislation is such that it is impossible, for instance, to come to do things quickly or in the things in a way that the public would expect. Um, the system has so many layers and so many hoops and so many elements of bureaucracy that it is incredibly difficult to get through these things without the abrasion that we so often hear about. So, for instance, my experience was in dealing with some of the most contentious cases that, you know, I'm a public servant, so I'm there to fulfill the statutory mandate. Police officers would be represented by the Federation and they would feel the need to have legal representation. The families that would be involved, whether they were victims, whether they were complainants, they felt that they had to get legal representation. And then we were, then there I was, the IOPC. And obviously, then you have to have the surrounding legal support as well. And then what it, what happens is you step through this process where everything is contentious. Everything is geared towards being an incredibly adversarial process and system. In the majority of cases, not everything, but in the vast majority of cases, that's how it goes. And <clears throat> as you step through it, then you realise how the system has actually created these conditions because of the way everything is set out. You know, part of the process was to introduce learning and reflection and to improve systems. And that bit happens. You know, I, I had many instances where I should use our legal powers to issue recommendations to improve systems. However, you know, with the line of accountability and how the system kind of churned through, um, it there isn't the sufficient space to have the clear demarcation and space around, well, is this a learning exercise? Is this something which belongs purely in that space versus the natural kind of machine, the natural system kind of progressing it along the lines that, you know, of accountability, of misconduct, um, and and so the process goes. But the IOPC is just one part of it. It's just one part of the system. When people think of the police complaint system, my my view is that any kind of additional funding for the IOPC to increase to help with increased volume is only tinkering at the edges of a system mm -hmm. which is really very, very old. You know, you have a fragmented system where police accountability rests across a range of bodies. You have the inspectorate, you have the IOPC, but then you have independent police misconduct panels. Then you have tribunals to those panels. Then you have police and crime commissioners. Then you have deputy mayors who have got responsibility for it. Then you've got police and crime panels who sit on top of that. Then you have the interplay when you're conducting some serious investigations of the criminal justice system, of mm -hmm. the Crown Prosecution Service, and then you've got um, the coroner service as well. I'm winching on. 
the reason I'm just kind of going at length of this is it's a really fragmented system. And outside of fundamental legislative reform, anything else is tinkering at it. And I actually believe that's what the whole system needs. It needs fundamental legislative reform. And do you, yeah, and um, do you think that, um, I mean, for example, I, I noticed the, um, I mean, the, the Home Office have looked at, uh, they are looking at the police regulations around misconduct in light of the fact that, you know, um, Mark Rowley said that he's got hundreds of officers who he thinks shouldn't be officers, but he, 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 he himself as commissioner cannot get, you know, get rid of those people. They have to go through all of these processes. Um, uh, do you think those police regulations, uh, which obviously emerge from the fact, you know, it's quite a unique thing, isn't it? A police officer, they have this, there, there is a, uh, uh, the office of constable, they're not employees like, um, like I'm an employee and therefore I'm subject to employment law and, and, um, and frankly, if I did some, if I did something bad in in the workplace, my employer could probably get rid of me pretty quickly um, under employment law, um, subject to tribunals and all the rest of it. Um, uh, but it, it's not like that in policing, is it? Because it's all written because there's you know you've got all this um, uh, you've got these police regulations that uh, make it. Uh, in, incredibly complicated but you you would basically look again at those police regulations and also at the the mix of institutions that are involved in in receiving complaints and uh, and, and so on definitely and and i think the metaphor i would use is i would encourage anybody to try draw that venn diagram of what the police complaints stroke accountability system looks like in this country and and if you drew it that would be a really complicated, complicated intersecting picture of where everything crosses over and where everything sits. And I think sometimes in this country, we we kind of comfort ourselves to say we've got really robust systems and we have really, and we do have really good people working across these range of organizations trying. Of course they are. However, if you look at what happened in America and you, you raise a really good point about contracts of employment, etc. What happened in America with George Floyd? We know the issues in American policing, very different style of policing, very militaristic, very challenging, very different environment. And it's not for me to be reductive here on, on the issues there, but what happened with George Floyd was, and it's a matter of record now, I mean, that police officer murdered George Floyd. And I think it was within weeks, the relative officers were sacked. Now, in this country, because of the systems that we have in place and because of a variety of reasons, some of which you've alluded to, you can never get that speed of accountability. You can never get that throughput in terms of something blatantly, blatantly incorrect happening, whether that's gross, gross misconduct, whatever it is, and then the throughput in terms of consequence and action. Here, it will take a long time and that long time varies. And that long time doesn't vary because people are incompetent. That long time varies because the system creates those conditions, which makes it impossible to do anything else. Yeah, and it's it, 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 your your sort of it, it's interesting this because one of the um, one of one of the criticisms of the IOPC that um, particularly the federation make and, and officers you know I've heard many officers make is that uh, they just take too long to investigate you know and so on. Um, I mean, what do you what do you say to that uh, criticism? Because I mean, what I'm hearing from you is that um, uh, your view would be it's not just the IOPC here, but there's a whole set of things which mean that these cases are taking a long time to, to get through. But how do you respond to that uh, criticism I mean, it, that's often made? It's a familiar refrain from the Federation. I understand why they make it. They campaign on this issue. But let's be clear, they also campaign that there should be a 12 month time limit. And then what happens after 12 months if the investigation goes beyond that? I mean, it, I don't know any other regulatory body that has a time cap on its investigations. That's quite, for, in its essence, that's problematic. There's many things the IOPC can be criticised for. I'm not here to defend the IOPC, but the, its timeliness massively improved. Mm. You know, and the IOPC's timeliness, from my you know, from my memory, it's better than many professional standards departments. 
across the 43 police forces uh, in the country. But it's the same challenge that the IOPC faces alongside professional standards departments. Obviously, it takes on the most serious cases, but professional standards departments, which investigate misconduct and gross misconduct, the majority of which, they have to deal with the same regulations and the same system. So I think I think the timeliness one is the wrong argument to make personally. And I think where there needs to be much more honest, open discussion is what reform is needed in the system. So for instance, if the Home Office's kind of view is that, you know, really we want to kind of embed reflective practice and it needs to be a much more learning culture, then what are the systems and processes and conditions created to engender that? For instance, we have so many learning recommendations in the system between the inspectorate, between coroners, between the IOPC. Who follows that up? Yeah. Whose responsibility is it to embed that, to make sure that systems change? And, you know, we have national policing, we have 43 different police forces across the country. We have different bodies in place, but you have a range of different recommendations out there. And one of the interminable challenges in, the, in policing and one of the most difficult professions is, you know, the challenges around culture, the change needed. And yet, arguably, there's a body of work already out there and a body of recommendations made, but the throughput of action into change, who takes a grip of that? Yeah, yeah, it's I mean, it's an interesting point, this about um, whether there is enough of a the the system's very fragmented. You know, as you say, you've got inspector, you've got IOPC, you've got um, uh, got coroners, you've got other um, recommendation. You've got the College of Policing, which will make, you know, set standards and all the rest of it. So you'll have a number of different people making sort of learning recommendations into the system um but then absolutely where where does that then go and then you have 43 forces as well and uh, and it just so do you i mean do you think there's a way there'd be a case for trying to consolidate some of that um because i mean chief constables will often say you know one of the problems we've got is we just get so many recommendations from different people it kind of it's hard to and you have to prioritize because you know you can't do everything um uh but yeah how what what would you have to do what are the kind of things you'd have to do to make sure that learning is getting gripped a bit more around the system what what would your view be on that at the minute, I think PCCs, police and crime commissioners, have got responsibility for that. But then where's the consistency in it, you know, mm. nationally? And I, I, I personally believe there, there's a role for somebody, for some agency to take grip of this and about the improvement of policing. Yeah. You know, we, we have the college who have their own mandate and they do some interesting things around leadership at the minute, which, you know, I'm, I'm a huge supporter of. But where is... Where is the kind of agency oversight of one of the biggest challenges that everybody, you know, would be united on? How do we improve policing? How do we make policing better, not just for the public, but for serving officers who sometimes have to bear the brunt of the worst issues around culture that sadly I had to see? And, and it's, it's all part of that bigger picture. But, but we have right now a system where people who are working in public service and working really hard and different facets of it are sometimes approaching the very same issues in slightly different ways and then you have an overwhelmed um, policing system and overwhelmed police forces under resourced who are trying to improve things who are being hit thing hit with things left right and center how do you make sure that the fundamental issues are gripped and changed things that we've been wrestling with let's be honest, decade after decade. And it's just one story just to finish on on this, Rick. I mean, I did a lot of work. I, I was the national discrimination lead for the IOPC. So I did a lot of stuff around race discrimination, which was our thematic area at the time. And I remember going into many meetings, you know, um, with kind of community stakeholders in London. And a very, very often common refrain was, when we're having discussions about what needs to change, it's just implement the recommendations. Yeah. You don't need to do anything out there. 
go back to Scarman, go back to McPherson, Lamy. Now we have Casey. You've got some of the stuff that you know I led on as well at the IOPC in the mix. And, and it's a very fair challenge. It was a very fair challenge. One I always used to reflect on when I heard it in meetings. And, the, and you know, community stakeholders quite rightly just said, implement the recommendations. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, we're not short on reports which have made recommendations for change, particularly around around race and policing, which is um, uh, uh, and yet, um, yeah, when you you look at things like the race action plan, the current race action plan, there's lots of things in there that were in Scarman and that were in McPherson, but have still not not happened. Um, so um, you talked about. Um, I want to. I want to come back to the point about culture in a bit. But the, the, you talked about um, uh, learning, and one of the sort of um, one of the tensions in the system. Um, and it seems to me it's quite. I can't. It's almost like an inherent tension in the system. Really, is this tension between accountability and and learning? You know. So this this somebody's done something wrong they need to be held to account lose their job whatever it is um go you know go to you know uh, go to court go to prison whatever it is um so there's an accountability uh, a, a, an important accountability element in the system because of the powers that the police have they need to be account they need to be individually accountable for uh, for their actions um, and yet at the same time, you want um, people don't want the same things to happen again. So we want to learn from mistakes. We want to learn from um, things that went wrong. Um, and the problem is sometimes that because of, because the accountability is so high stakes for people that you don't often have an honest conversation about what went wrong because people don't want to um, mm. expose themselves to um, uh, to. Um, uh, to you know, expose themselves to law, and and so uh, you get this kind of this hunkering down sometimes, this uh, and so on. And people people sometimes compare this to the airline industry, and I'm sure you've heard this comparison where um, you know if there's a plane accident, there's this kind of open process where everybody are, are kind of bl are up to a certain point, as I understand it, a kind of blameless process where people sort of say, actually, what we we don't want planes to crash, so therefore let's just get up get all our dirty laundry and hang it out so we can understand exactly what went wrong. We can change the systems and then the planes will be safer. Um, what do you, uh, uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on that, that tension uh, and the extent to which um, policing is like the airline industry or could it, you know, could it ever be um, like the airline industry? And I think even that, that term about what the airline industry do is kind of cut seeped into corporate management they call it black box thinking don't they yeah. where you remove yeah. blame out yeah. of it but this is the key question i think the tension between accountability and learning i think enough thought hasn't been given into it in terms of the systems we've got in place to be able to do that in a clear way and let me be clear we need accountability you know it goes back to scarman it goes back to mcpherson which said you always you need an independent body that is capable of having some form of independent oversight of the police. And in those particular guises, it was in the form of an independent investigation. And there's a reason that's come out, come about. And the reason it's come about is because of, you know, key issues um, around race and policing and that intersection. And that was back, you know, back in the 70s and 80s and predating that. Now the landscape has moved on and predominantly that conversation is centred around the Met, which has moved on to around male violence against women and girls. And we also have um, um, institutionalised homophobia from Scotland down to England. It affects UK policing. So the need for accountability because of the profession of policing, I think you cannot get away from that. But where that bar and how that is calibrated in the system, I think that is the interesting conversation. Mm -hmm. Because you're right, I've seen so many times where we had investigations and you, you just you just wanted the officers just to tell you what had happened, but the system created such defensive postures that it, it was just very, very hard and painful. Yeah. and. Sometimes you have to do the independent investigation, um, but 
when you came out of it, um, it was the, the, the officers were hadn't done anything wrong. I'm just talking in general mm -hmm. terms. And what what was flawed might have been the policy, um, or the organisational process. But because the system was such, that would have been a very difficult, painful process. And I think what I'm, I think what I'm kind of saying here, Rick, is that why I've said you know we need kind of legislative reform is that this sort of conversation needs to happen in a kind of deep, detailed way, so that we have a system which is fit for where we are now and if you look at you know if you look at the genesis of the IOPC and go back to the inspector how old is it I mean mm -hmm. the IPCC was created off the back of um the Stephen Lawrence inquiry you know it's mm -hmm. a quarter, quarter of a century ago nearly the inspector mm -hmm. is much older and then we have recent innovations like PCCs and everything but is it making policing better is it engendering Public confidence in policing. Well, just look at the just look at the statistics around there on how the public, what the public feel, how the public kind of view um, things at the minute. And I don't think it is because of how things have moved on. And you've had the inspectorate separately calling for more powers. You've had the IOPC asking separately for more funding. So you can see movement. But what I'm saying is just treating one or the other and you know kind of giving more funding here or slightly tinkering with powers there that's not going to do enough that's not yeah. going to do it yeah so yeah i mean so you're you you, you think there needs to be an end-to-end -end review of the whole way this, this system operates um which which i think makes makes a lot of sense um and um on the um wanted to touch on some of the sort of some of the drivers of all of this and some of the things which um uh, you know you talk you talked about racism homophobia sexism and obviously the casey report um made you know really strong findings on all three of those in relation to the met um and i just wondered do you do you think um well, let me put it like this, and you can answer it in any way you want. But I mean, you know, how how big a cultural problem is this? And are you uh, so how how big a problem is it in terms of culture? And I know from many of the cases you looked at, there there were there were clearly cultural issues in the sense that attitudes, behaviours, um, values um, were uh, not right, and uh, and were causing uh, and were leading people to um to to do terrible things um so how 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 big and widespread a problem do you think it is in, in policing and also um do you do you think that um uh policing is set up to change that culture you know i mean do, do you do you think as as things stand policing is in a position where it really can tackle those attitudes, norms, values, behaviours that we've we've seen? That's that's a big question, isn't it? It's yeah. a big question. So like, if I take the first part, what did I see around culture? So, you know, I, you know, I, a big chunk of my work was centred around culture. I mean, Operation Houghton is probably, and which was the IOPC independent investigation, series of investigations into officers based predominantly in Charing Cross Police Station, that that was one of the biggest kind of cases I dealt with, yeah. you know, around culture. Um, but I've spoken to many officers over the years, many officers. I've seen that and I've seen it through putting the work. And there's kind of there's two points here. Obviously, I was director for London, so I had kind of oversight of a number of forces, but the Metropolitan Police Service was the biggest one. And I think sometimes the issues around the Met get conflated with national issues to do with policing. Mm -hmm. And I think there are specific issues with the Met. And we've seen some stuff already reported this week, which has come out from the National mm -hmm. Black Police Association. But the KC review was not, was, was speaking about the Metropolitan Police and the journey the Met had to do. And, mm -hmm. and the issues I spoke about a couple of years ago, very publicly and when 
I made the decision to release the WhatsApp exchanges of these officers was trying to lift the lid on what officers who come from minoritized groups or communities have to suffer within policing because they are victims, these officers. Yeah. So you have the particular issues around the Met, you have um, things which are well documented, you have things in the Casey review. And at the minute we have very, very good, strong rhetoric from the current commissioner. But to me, that's all that is at this stage, it's rhetoric. And the issues around culture and police culture permeated, you know, for a long, long time. And how how we move on from that is is the key question. Um, so it, so that's one thing. I think it's important to, to not conflate the issues which are well documented and a matter of record that the Met is currently working through to address these challenges with national policing. But that's not to say that the other 42 police forces, there, are, there aren't issues, yeah. but there will be, but there'll be a range of issues. There'll be different police forces there on different journeys, some much more progressive in terms of challenging um, and doing the work on inclusive cultures, others more average, others in denial. And and I, and I, and I know from my conversations um, with past officers, with serving officers um, who come from minoritized backgrounds um, that they have challenges. They have still have incredible challenges in police forces, but they don't have the freedom to speak about these challenges because they are in that system. And so policing still faces these challenges. But I just I thought it was important Rick, just to make that separation, yeah. because sometimes there's a conflation between what's happening with the with the Met and and yet then you have the rest of policing, but that's not to pretend the rest is perfect. But in terms of solutions and how you try and kind of move the dial here, I mean, I I, I think policing is too insular here. You will always get exceptional leaders that get it and drive the work forward in the way they need to and embody this in, in their force and their leadership teams. To, to build those inclusive cultures. And by building an inclusive culture, you're making it better for everybody, not just some. You raise and create the right working environment for everybody. But too often you get officers who are given the lead on culture, who frankly don't have the professional experience to do it outside of their own personal leadership experience. But if you look at if you look more broadly across private sector, you have a whole profession dedicated to this. You have directors of culture, of people, of belonging, whose sole profession is to curate that, is to make that better, is to kind of make sure that the experience of somebody, you know, on the bottom rung of the kind of corporate ladder is the same as the person kind of near enough or at the top. And there are whole professions out there, but I think policing, um, personally, I think policing needs to embrace that um, that thinking and to bring some of that um, inside because I think you also need that consistency. Police officers naturally rotate through the promotion cycle. So wherever sometimes progress is made, sometimes progress is lost as mm -hmm. well because, um, because people move on and sometimes they become single points of failure. Whereas if you have structures in place and 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 um, roles created specifically, which do this and only this, you've got a better chance of making progress in the area. But yeah. that's what I think. Yeah, yeah, no, um, uh, really, really, really helpful. And um, what I, I, we'll come to people, we've got a, a couple of questions have, have, have come up and please do add more questions because we'll come to them in a, in a minute. Um, uh, what do you think you talked you, you talked there about leadership um do you think that because it seems to me one of the issues in the system is you know if you're looking if you're sort of thinking about culture change you know how do, where do you start changing cultures it seems to me leadership's a really important place to start um and i just wondered if you had thoughts on um whether um policing is doing enough to um uh develop the leaders that it that it needs and to give and to give the leaders that it's and to give its leaders the right uh, support to be effective in in, in leadership roles um which um 
and in a way to try to to try to deal with some of these cultural problems. And I know, you, you know, I mean, we know from um, stuff that happened in the in the army where they, you know, they've invested quite a lot in leadership development precisely because they had some issues around toxic culture. You know, there was bullying and and suicides and all sorts of awful things happening, and they they did invest a lot, particularly in that kind of frontline supervisory leadership roles. Um, do you? Yeah, do you do you do you think um, policing does enough to develop its its leaders? Short answer, no, yeah. no. And uh, the Sandhurst example is a very good one. You know, I think. I mean, he, here's the question, Rick. I remember the good leaders in my career. On one hand, there have been so few. I think exceptional leadership is actually just that is the exception, it's not the norm. But in a profession like policing, where leadership, and because of the powers and all the issues and all the challenges that they, these police officers have to deal with, it's it's incredibly important. It is, it is so important. And yet the irony is that as you kind of go up the ladder, you get more and more of it. Whereas actually, you know, how are we creating leaders at all levels? And I think, I think the College of Policing is now starting a programme. We've, they've got a kind of institute around leadership and there's some really interesting pieces of work going on. But to me, I think you've you've got to give police officers a fair crack at this, you know, in terms of the front line as well. How, how can they have the right amount of time to develop as leaders without having to kind of worry about, you know, um, the day job? How can policing as a, as a, as a profession carve out that time so it's not just like an in initial training phase and then police officers are let you know are, are put onto street duties or wherever they go you know they are given that they are given that consistency and that space to develop their leadership skills but also a consistency of message and style you know what how do we want our leaders to conduct themselves you know the expectations of people um coming into the force now are different we are into gen z and other gens um, whose expectations are different from the likes of you and I, right, who are of a different age demographic, if I can be polite. Um, <laughs> but there are, and quite rightly, they're higher. Quite rightly, they're higher. They will not tolerate some of the things that I've had to tolerate in the workplace. And that is right. But how are we equipping our leaders um, in policing to deal with the modern workplace, to deal with the challenges, but also the incredibly difficult role of police officers. How are they able to embody the code of ethics, these new values the College of Policing has issued? Leadership is a fundamental part of it, and not everybody will have the same ability, but at least if we thought about it at a system level and said, actually you know even for frontline supervisors we need to give them the right amount of leadership training so we can have leaders across the organization so that it's not such a big disconnect between chief constable the strategic intent and right the way down the kind of hierarchical structure down to sergeant yeah ultimately i believe every police officer is a leader and i think you know how we talk about leadership and how we have that language. It has to be more than just an e-learning bolted on somewhere. But the challenge is obviously operational with budgets cut, funding tight, the incredible policing challenges out there. How can the system create that bandwidth for police officers to actually enjoy the benefits of some proper leadership training so that when they are faced with some of these difficult challenges on the ground, some of these ethical challenges, that, that they actually feel sufficiently equipped. And because, to be honest, some of them aren't. And I've seen that in the work that I did at the IOPC. You you watched it and you watched it and you thought, my God, they just got that so wrong. And then you looked at sometimes the experience and they were relatively new in service. And and you, you obviously you cannot substitute years and decades of experience, but you can give consistency of message and consistency of vision in terms of how you want to lead and give everybody a fair chance at it as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, 
that that was that was, that was really helpful. Well, I think we're, we're sort of clocking up some good uh, recommendations here in terms of end-to-end -end review, in terms of um, leadership development, um, uh, uh, bringing in outsiders. You know, so I'm, uh, we're, we're sort of gathering some great great ideas i think for how, how the system could could be improved but let's let's have a look at some of the, the questions that we've had in from um from people so we've got um one question uh, in from paul west who says many years ago late 1980s i undertook uh, research in the usa looking at various stages of handling public complaints against the police and making recommendations on how each of the stages could be improved and made more responsive. Sal makes a very fair point about one of the main reasons for IOPC investigations taking so long is the number of different agencies involved in the system. Accepting that every investigation is different, does he know whether any data analysis has been undertaken to quantify the number of days taken at each stage of the um, investigative and administrative uh, process? Um, and so I'm just trying to um, get the rest of the question. Um, uh, in order to establish objective where the delays lie. So, I mean, do you know if there's any analysis of, you know, um, how much time is taken up when it gets into this bit of the system versus that bit of the system? Mm. I don't know if there's any publicly available analysis, but for my time, I think we did do some internal pieces of work, you know, just to understand, because obviously we want investigations to run as quickly as possible. But that's really where I started to kind of get insight as to, you know, sometimes things were delayed with a crime prosecution service. Sometimes things were held sub judice. Sometimes, you know, it was to do with, you know, an ongoing inquest. Um, sometimes you're waiting for expert evidence. It's when you get inside the system, you understand how complex it is and sometimes how, you know, those different intersections um, play out, but sorry, just to answer the question, I'm not aware, available. I'm not aware of any kind of public um, research that's been done to show the the, yeah. the delays in the system. I'm not really sure that that's out there. Yeah, well, it'd be, it's an interesting question, though, isn't it? It'd be it'd be interesting to look at look at doing something like that. Um, let's. Um, so, a question from Anne. Um, I, so you you called for a, a systematic review of the way this whole system is operating, um, and Anne is asking who who would be in a position to conduct such a review? Is it the Home Office, or would an independent panel of researchers be uh, a good alternative? And who could should instigate uh, the review? It's a good question, isn't it? Um, I think you need some independence in it as well, and I think you need some brave courageous thinking to be part of that. I think you need to have people, um, I think you need a mixture in there, whether that's a Royal Commission, whether that's an independent review commissioned by the Home Office, I, I'm not entirely sure, but I think the mix of people in there would need to be a mix of people with um, maybe lived experience of the system, academics, experts, but I think you need diversity of thought as part of that process, because it's no good just recreating something which maybe already exists when some of these issues that we speak about around police culture and various issues are decades old. So we, you know, if if, if there's a time for reform and and I, I believe, you know, we do need to look at everything end to end, then I think you need to have the right voices and expertise around the table in order to do that in the right way. Yeah. Great, no, um, very, very helpful. Um, and Julian um, says, in my experience, many corporate uh, culture change programs often don't really achieve their intent. Culture change is a black box. When you scratch the surface and ask how a program will change uh, people's behaviours, no one really knows. Um, that's a comment rather than a question. I don't know if you have a response to that, Sal. Um, I think my, my, there's one point I should have made earlier and when we talk about culture sometimes I think we let leaders off the hook because culture is not this amorphous gas that just exists by itself in organizations culture is the permissive behavior that leaders allow in organizations yeah. and I think the single biggest responsibility of any leader is to curate and cultivate the right culture of your organization because if you can establish that, then that's fertile ground for everything else to grow from. Um, 
And I think too often even, and it's something I should really be better at, we, the language that we use, you know, culture is spoken of as a separate thing, but it's not. It's yeah. not. It is It is the responsibility of leaders. And if we're talking about the, the culture of an organisation, leaders cannot abdicate the responsibility from it because it's their behaviour or their or their per permission, whether that's conscious or unconscious, that allows that. Yeah, that's a really, it's a really good way of putting it. Uh, culture is the permissive behaviour that leaders allow. I, I think that's really, uh, yeah, because you're right. Otherwise, you, you're sort of making it into this kind of independent thing, which, um, uh, and it, and then it becomes hard to see where's the agency and where do you actually get some, you know, where, where can people actually have an, have an impact and try to change it. Um, uh, that's great. I wanted to ask you a question about um, uh, the the Met, uh, and obviously you, as London Regional Director, you you know you were the, the Met was by far the biggest force that you were uh, looking at, um, and there's been a lot of debate about um, uh, you know how much reform is required to the Met, and you, you'll have seen Louise Casey in her review said that she wanted to give Mark Rowley um, you know the opportunity to do the reforms that he's bringing in now and uh, b before you, before we get involved in sort of structural change although Casey did say um, if if um, if that doesn't work then structural change should sort of come back on the table so I just wonder what you think about that do you think there's a need to do something quite big and structural to the way the Met is set up? Yes I do I do Rick and I think here I would kind of draw on the example of Northern Ireland, where you had the Royal Ulster Constabulary. I know, different country, different context. I understand that. However, it was also, you know, an institution, a policing institution that really struggled with trust and confidence for different reasons. And obviously, um, I think Lord, Lord Patton, you know, kind of commissioned the report and ultimately reformed the whole institution and it became a um, police service for Northern Ireland. And I think something like fundamental like that is required for the Met. And if you look at, if you just look at um, the basis of history, um, I, I worry that it is just not capable of that level of reform that is needed. And obviously, you know, Baroness Casey has set that in a report. You know that that is that is something which has been put in the report. If these improvements don't happen, then she herself has said that. Um, but if you look at the way the Met is structured with all its big national functions, um, to me that doesn't really make sense as a structure. You know why wouldn't they be under the purview of a national organisation? For instance, the National Crime Agency. Um, it's not for me to say where things sit, but you're talking about you know a huge police force with a re with an incredibly challenging mandate with a significant change journey to travel an improvement journey and is it structured for success I, I i don't believe it is and i think there are lessons to be drawn from northern ireland and what was required there and that was not an easy thing to do it was not an easy thing and I think when you look at the Met and you look at the history and you look at all the various really difficult um, incidents that have happened, many of which have centred around race, um, it is, I, 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 I'm of the strong view it needs that structural reform. I'm of the strong view that it needs it. Um, but we have, we have a plan in place um, and uh, I hope for everybody serving within the Met and also for the people living in London, that that plan is successful because it needs to be. Yeah, um, but it's it's that thing, isn't it? That the um, uh, what they managed to do in Northern Ireland was uh, well, they they re they refounded the, the police institution. You know, they they said this is a new police institution, and and um, uh, and they and they had to do that because a whole part of the community just did not, you know, uh, had such a long history of discrimination and not, you know, of unfair policing and um, uh, and simply wouldn't, you know, uh, and in many communities didn't recognise 
the legitimacy of the police at all. Um, uh, so they they refounded it, um, and I think um, I mean I was in Belfast recently, and you can see. Um, you know, they now have a policing board there, which contains everybody from the DUP to Sinn Féin, and they all, you know, and they're all sat in a room trying to, <laughs> trying to, trying to work with the police to improve to improve things, which you know, 20 years ago you said was completely, I mean, just a, a fanciful idea. Um, uh, so you, you think it, it's um, the problems the Met has are, are so significant that you essentially need to refound it as an institution. I mean, the point you make, Rick, about, you know, a, a part of the community in Northern Ireland just not having the confidence or, or, or the Royal Ulster Constabulary having lost that confidence of a part of the community. How is that different in London in terms of the Met and Black communities? Yeah. I, I, I don't think it's actually any different. I think what is different is that Black communities have been, have been seeing this repeatedly for decades. Just, I just don't think people are listening, and I just think it's, I think it's become, I just think it's become a level of tolerance. There's a, there's almost a level of tolerance um, around that lack of trust and confidence. But what are the consequences of that? It affects, it affects the Pelian model of consent that we operate under. I mean, is that even viable in London anymore? I, I think that's a big question to ask. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the Pelian model is all about, um, yeah, policing by consent and policing with the support of the uh, of the community, which um, uh, I mean, I've, you look at some figures when you break it down by borough and levels of confidence in, in the Met in some boroughs are, are, are definitely sub 50 you percent. Know? So and and if you broke that down demographically um you'd find some parts of the community where levels of confidence in the police would be very very low indeed um, um so it, it, it's a really it's a really fair uh, fair question and um what do you um there's, there's often a danger in these conversations that that we all sound very, we all sound very sort of fatalistic, um, um, or the you know think because because there are so many problems in the system, absolutely. But are there is there are there things that you feel hopeful about? Yes. I, mean, I guess that's that's a, a, maybe a, a good point to end on, which was just to say, are there things that give you optimism for the future in terms of the way in which policing and its relationship to communities could could develop? Definitely. Look, I don't want to come across fatalistic. I didn't spend the best part of a decade in a system I didn't try and believe in or try and kind of do the best in. There's so many good people working in so many different parts of the system. But, I, I, you know, I want to end by paying tribute to all the amazing police officers that I know. And I know many former, I know many serving officers. And there's a whole generation of officers coming up that get it, that want to make change. And but it is such a such a difficult profession. And I think the one thing that I would say um, to serving officers is um, try and be sensible when you look at social media. Social media and Twitter is not a barometer for what society thinks. I, I heard a stat years ago which said 10 percent of the population use Twitter and only 10 percent of the people that use Twitter are actually active on Twitter. So you're getting an extreme algorithmic algorithmic driven version of of public reaction it's it's not it's not the case it's not the case and what and some of the police officers that i've met i've encountered you know and know of the privilege of knowing are some of the most inspirational people um i've met and you know i'm gonna hold up my phone for a second right so when i left the iopc last year i think I reflected on my phone book and in my phone book I've got the numbers of academics, I've got the numbers of kind of people who work in charities, um, senior community kind of um, elders and um, former officers, serving officers and and my phone book told me the way I did the job and and I'm and I suppose the way I just wanted to end the conversation is that despite everything people are making change out there despite how hard it is there's good stuff happening in different police forces which is making a difference and which is 
kind of pushing the agenda. Policing just needs to get better at sharing some of this good stuff that happens, you know, in different forces um, together. But there's a whole generation of officers up and coming, which I'm convinced can be part of the turning of the tide of some of these challenges. But we need the right system in place to help that. Yeah. Great. Well, look, um, thank you so much, Sal. That was a, a really, really interesting conversation um, and we're really grateful uh, for your time. Um, thank you all um, uh, for joining in and for posting your questions. Um, it was uh, great to, to have comments and questions from, from all of you. And um, please do um, stay in touch um, and uh, we will be having further um friday exchanges in the months ahead we've got our next one is next month we'll advertise it i'm terrible at dates um but well, it's coming up next month with stan gilmore who was uh, director of the violence reduction unit in thames valley in thames valley and uh, former uh, police officer uh, of very many years and we're going to be talking to stan about public health approaches to crime and prevention and what we can do to really prevent harm rather than just dealing with the problems afterwards. And then in April, we'll be talking to Professor uh, Sarah Charman from uh, Portsmouth University, who is um, an, a, a leading academic who's been conducting some really good research, actually a lot of which speak to some of the issues we've been talking um, uh, to Sal about today, particularly around workforce and she's done a lot of research with police officers about their experiences of what, what it's like to um, to be a police officer. And so um, we'll be talking to Sarah about her reflections on, on that research in April. Um, but we'll advertise all that on social media. But um, in the meantime, um, thank you very much, Sal. Um, uh, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, have a great weekend.